This is an article from the Reformed Presbyterian entitled The Waldenses from the Covenanter. The Church of Christ has in every age been a small, despised, witnessing, and suffering community. Before the coming of the Savior, not only was the nation whom God selected to be the, depos the depository of his truth hemmed in by enemies on every side and held in universal contempt, but even of them it was only a small remnant that waited for the consolation of Israel, and that amid national defection continued uh, and that amid national defection continued faithful to the covenant of their God. They were not all Israel that were of Israel. A few amid suffering and death held fast their profession. Grievous oftentimes were their afflictions. They had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonments. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. Hebrews 11, verses 36-38 through 38. The Redeemer had, during his sojourn on earth, forewarned his followers that they need not expect to find the case altered under the new and more spiritual economy which he came to introduce. Ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. In the world ye shall have tribulation. While he represented his genuine disciples as ever witnessing to his truth, and assured them that the gates of hell should never prevail against them, he characterized his people as a little flock, and told them expressly that they might calculate on suffering for his sake. With our eye fixed on these features, which have been sketched by an unerring hand, we are led, in searching for the covenant society of the Lamb amid days of darkness, to adopt a course very different from that pursued by the secular, and too often by the ecclesiastical historian. The atmosphere of courts and palaces has been hitherto unfavorable to the growth of vital godliness. While spiritual wickedness has established its seat in the high places of earth, and the spirit of the religion of Christ has been lost amid schemes of worldly ambition, the saints of the Most High God have been found existing in places remote from the walks of ambition, and their numbers have often consisted of the poor and unlearned. While the whole world has been wandering after the beast, the two witnesses have prophesied in sackcloth, and while during the 1260 years of anti-Christian oppression none might buy or sell who had not received the mark of the beast in their foreheads, the church the faithful witnessing spouse of the Redeemer has been in the wilderness. After the man of sin had arrogantly assumed the mediator's titles and had claimed to exercise his power, the profession of Christianity rapidly declined. Instances of the power of godliness became every day more rare. Darkness overspread the nations and gross darkness the people. In the darkest times, however, Jehovah's promise to his son that a seed shall serve him has not failed to accomplishment. He has never left himself without a witness. Rapid and extensive as was the increase of anti-Christianism, and few and unnoticed as have been the faithful witnesses, and difficult as it may seem to be for the historian to trace with accuracy the bounds of their habitations or the truths for which they contended, neither the Savior's church nor his cause has ceased to exist. A remnant there has been, a remnant there always will be, which keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. Designing to present to our readers from time to time historical notices of the witnesses of the Lamb and intending to show that they have, in every age, held the same glorious truths and been distinguished for the same course of conduct, we begin with the Waldenses. The Kingdom of Italy is separated from France by the Alps, the loftiest range of mountains in Europe. The southern provinces of France, which border on these natural barriers, contain an intermixture of hill and valley, and the northern part of Italy, which, from its proximity to the Alps, is termed Piedmont. The word Piedmont signifies at the foot of the mountain. The province is so named from its being situated at the foot of the Alps. This northern part of Italy is especially remarkable for the number of valleys frequently divided from each other by precipitous heights and mountain torrents with which it is filled. It is amid these fastnesses of nature that we are to trace out the habitations in which the subjects of this sketch from early time worship the God of their fathers, and from the place of their residence do they derive the name by which they are chiefly distinguished in the page of ecclesiastical history. It has been thought indeed they derive their name from Peter Waldo, a celebrated leader among them, of whom notice shall be afterwards taken. It is more probable, however, that he received his surname from them 
than that they were indebted to him for the designation which they bear. Certain it is that they existed and were known by this title long before his day. From the Latin word which signifies a valley, they were termed valensis, or waldenses. And from a provincial change in the word, vadois, or vadoi, these names simply signify inhabit inhabitants of the valleys. Sometimes they were distinguished by the places in which they lived in greatest numbers, as Albigenses, from their residence about the town of Albi, and throughout Albigeois, a country in the south of France, and the Leonidists, or poor men of Lyons, because they existed in considerable numbers in Lyons and its neighborhood. For a similar reason, they are spoken of by historians under the terms Picards, Bohemians, Lombards, etc. Frequently, their enemies designated them by reproachful epithets, they being called Catharii, Puritans, Paterines, illiterate or lowbred, in Sabbathists. They had this name because they refused to observe days in, honors of the, in, in honor of the saints, uh, neglectors of the Sabbath, Mangians and Arians. The Waldenses were firm Trinitarians, but because they refused to worship the host or consecrated wafer, they were falsely charged with denying the divinity of the Savior. And sometimes they were named after most, the most celebrated of their pastors, being called Josephists, uh, Josephites, Arnoldists, Berengarians, etc. There is reason to believe that these various appellations were distinctive of one and the same people, a people that in different places and periods of time maintained a holy separation from the corruptions of popery, and by their doctrine and lives testified faithfully to the purity and power of the Savior's truth. The origin of this singular people has been a subject of much discussion among the writers of ecclesiastical history, some referring to it, some referring to the time of Cloud of Turin, he was a celebrated pastor of Turin, the capital of Piedmont, who in the beginning of the ninth century manfully opposed the growing defections of the Romish church, inculcated sound doctrines, and lived a life of eminent piety and devotedness. In the ninth, and others of that of Peter of Lyons in the twelfth centuries. With neither of these opinions does there appear sufficient reason to coincide. The Waldenses, by whatever other names they were known, at an early period, we have reason to believe existed from the days of the apostles. In the south of France and north of Italy, there were found many, during the persecutions of the pagan Roman emperors, that witnessed a good confession, and gave evidence of the power of vital godliness in their hearts, by surrendering their lives rather than relinquish the truth. The spirit of these primitive martyrs remained long after they had finished their testimony. Throughout the places where they had preached, prayed, and died, the corruptions of Antichrist made slow progress. Many in Italy and France preserved their garments undefiled and held fast amid growing corruptions the doctrines of the apostles of the Lamb. The Paulicians in the 7th century and the Catharii, as they were opprobriously called, opprobriously called excuse me, in the 9th and 10th centuries, had spread throughout many provinces of Italy, France, and Spain. Even at Rome, they existed in considerable numbers, and according to the testimony of their persecutors, the principles of the sect were spread in various places, and their adherents amounted to many thousands. For a length of time, these witnesses for the truth seemed to have acted much in the way of the Puritans of England in the early days of the Reformation. They remained in the communion of the general church while its corruptions were but partially diffused, and while they were permitted to hold fast their own integrity, and to hope for the redress of grievances. The abominations of Antichrist did not rise to a head or put forth all their odious features at once. Even after the Roman pontiff had assumed the title of universal bishop, he did not for a time exercise fully the impious power which he had claimed. The great swelling words of the little horn were not heard in the remote places where the friends of purity had their habitation, and to change the times and seasons was not at first attempted. While it was thus, many of the faithful remained in communion, and tolerated abuses in the hope of seeing them afterwards done away. When the features of the man of sin sitting in the temple of God became more fully developed, and anti-Christian wickedness had wholly obscured the light of divine truth, and corrupted the fellowship of the church, they separated, and thenceforth continued amid persecution and trial to wait upon ordinances scripturally dispensed in their own community, and to contend earnestly for the faith once delivered unto the saints." It is not improbable that the Waldenses did not fully establish a distinct ecclesiastical communion until the days of Claude of Turin, though it is very apparent from the testimony of early historians that at a much earlier period they partially acted on this principle. 
If proof were wanting of the antiquity as well as the purity of these early witnesses, it might be copiously furnished from the testimonies even of their enemies. Everinus, after detailing the cruelties to which they were exposed by the papists and their constancy in suffering, adds, quote, Their heresy is this. They say that the church is only among themselves because they alone follow the ways of Christ and imitate the apostles, unquote. You, said they, speaking of their enemies, adulterate the word of God, seeking your own things, whereas we and our families, we and our fathers, excuse me, have been born and brought up in the apostolic doctrine, have continued in the grace of Christ, and shall continue so to the end. They farther place no confidence in the intercession of saints, and for all things observed in the church, which have not been established by Christ and his apostles, they call superstitious. They deny the doctrine of purgatory and reject as utterly useless all prayers and oblations for the dead. In reference to their numbers, he adds, those of them who have returned to our church tell us they, have, uh, they had great numbers of their persuasions scattered almost everywhere, and that among them are many of our clergy and monks. As for those who were burnt, they, in the defense, in the defense they made for themselves, told us that this heresy has been concealed from the time of the martyrs, and that it had existed in Greece and other countries. These are Dr. Alex's remarks on the ancient churches of Piedmont, page 140. The testimony of Bernard to the holiness of their lives, even at the time he was opposing them with vehemence, is, quote, If you ask them of their faith, nothing is more Christian. If you observe their conversation, nothing can be more blameless. And what they speak, they prove by deeds. You may see a man for the testimony of his faith frequent the church, honor the elders, offer his gift, make his confession, receive the sacrament. What more like a Christian? As to life and manners, he circumvents no man, overreaches no man, does violence to no man. He fasts much and eats not the bread of idleness, but works with his hands for his support." Unquote. The historian who relates the persecutions to which the Waldenses were exposed says, "...their opinions have been transmitted in Gaul from generation to generation, almost from the origin of Christianity." Pope Alexander III, in a synod held at Tours in year 1167, declares that the doctrine of the Vaudoy is a damnable heresy of long continuance. And to close these singular attestations of their antiquity and character, Reiner, an inquisitor of the 13th century, thus speaks of them, quote, The heresy of the Vaudoy, or poor people of Lyons, is of great antiquity. Among all the sects that either are or have been, there is none more dangerous to the church than, than, and that for three reasons. First, because it is the sect of the longest standing of any, for some say that it hath been continued down ever since the time of Pope Sylvester in the 4th century, and others ever since that of the apostles. Secondly, because it is the most general of all, general of all sects, for scarcely is there a country to be found where this sect hath not spread itself, and thirdly, because it hath the greatest appearance of piety, for in the sight of all, these men are just and honest in their transactions. Believe of God what ought to be believed. Receive all of the articles of the Apostles' Creed, and only profess to hate the Church of Rome." Unquote. From these testimonies of enemies, it will appear, we trust, abundantly manifest, that the Waldenses may be justly regarded as having had their origin in the days of primitive Christianity, and as the depositories of the truth which had been transmitted to them, uncontaminated by human additions from the apostles and the first ministers of the New Testament.